Well, hello, welcome. Thank you all for joining this very first webinar uh, hosted by the Donut Economics Action Lab, or DEAL. So I'm Andrew Fanning, uh, Research and Data Analysis Lead here at DEAL, and I'm really, really excited to welcome you all here today or tonight or this morning, depending on where you are. Uh, I just have to say that since we launched the online DEAL platform less than two months ago, I've just been amazed together with my colleagues and inspired by just the energy bubbling up out of this community as people take the ideas of donut economics, uh, innovate with them, share them, adapt them to their own context in their own places from neighborhoods to nations, as well as in the global north and in the global south. So this webinar tonight is part of an ongoing series that we're going to be hosting that aims to bring together people who, with a shared interest in translating the global donut down to many smaller scales. And the reason why we're hosting that is because we believe that peer-to-peer -peer inspiration is just one of the few forces that can be scaled up in order to, to meet the radical transformation that's needed in order to address 21st century challenges. So we're facing climate breakdown, there's the global pandemic being felt disproportionately by age, race, gender, power, global north, global south. All of these crises, uh, I believe, we believe that peer-to-peer -peer inspiration is a just key force in order to mobilize the action needed to actually meet the needs of all people within the limits of our living planet. So I have the honor tonight to welcome you all. Uh, it's a privilege. And just to say that we're going to be giving a brief introduction. I'm here with my colleague, Kate Rayworth, who is, of course, the, the author of Donut Economics and the co-founder of DEAL. And we're delighted to be joined tonight by three inspiring groups of innovative change makers from Berlin, from Cambridge, as well as from Brussels. So tonight, each of these groups are taking just distinct approaches to, to applying the the concept of the donut to their own place. And it's just going to be wonderful. We're going, we're hearing from George Wagner Loss as well as Sebastian Wolf in Berlin, Councillor Katie Thornborough and Clara Todd in Cambridge, and Laure Marcher and Tristan Dissot, who are joining us from Brussels. And thank you to all of our speakers for joining us here tonight. As well, if English is not your first language, we extra appreciate the, the effort that you're taking. And if English is your first language, then, then that's great too. Thank you. Welcome. Let me please hand over to Kate to say hello and to as well give a bit of context on our approach to downscaling the donut. Thank you very much. And over to you, Kate. Thanks, Andrew. And hello. It's amazing seeing the chat box just streaming with Greetings from all over the world. It's brilliant. This is Deal's first ever webinar, as Andrew said. So for us as a team, this is a big moment and we're so thrilled that so many people are joining us. So I'm just going to dive in and bring a bit of context and the background to why this is a very special moment for us as the team at Deal. So I'm going to start by sharing my screen. Oh, start at the end, wrong end of what I wanted to show you. There we go. I hope this looks a bit familiar. It's the donut. It's, we offer it as humanity's 21st century goal. Leave no one falling short in the hole in the middle without the essentials of life, but don't overshoot the life supporting systems of planet Earth. It is drawn from the sustainable development goals. So all the governments in the world have already agreed that everyone in the world has a claim to these essentials in the center. And it's drawn from the planetary boundaries, Earth system science. So it's rooted in up-to-date science. So it's about thriving in balance. The first diagram of the donut was published in 2012 as an Oxfam discussion paper. And ever since that day, people have wanted to downscale the donut, to bring it to their context, to their place, to their country, their community, to their town. And it's been amazing seeing the variety of creations and innovations that people have done with this. So I've had such fun gathering ones that I remember right back from 2012, 2013, you can see in the top corner there, there was a workshop in Berlin. People saying, hmm, how do we, how do we bring this here? In South Africa, in China, in Wales, um, Andrew and his colleague Dan O'Neill downscaled the donut for 150 nations. 
a, a, an architect started designing a new city district in Stockholm and he said he was going to call them donut districts. So there's just such life and innovation been going on for years around this. Over the last year and a half, I had the privilege of getting together with the brilliant biomimicry thinker Janine Benyus. She started playing with a donut and something happened in the way she was playing and I was playing with it and we came up with a framework that we think really provides a grounding that can be adapted to many scales. So I just want to introduce that briefly. So when, and I'm gonna talk about cities, but then we're gonna talk about more. So when the city, a place meets the donut, we think what's important is to recognize that we, we want to focus on our local aspirations of us, the people of here, both meeting our needs and living within the means of the planet. But every place on planet earth is connected to everywhere else on planet earth. And so we need to put those local aspirations for good life here, in the context of global responsibilities, ensuring that we are not undermining good lives for everybody else. And so that local aspiration in the context of global responsibility came the basis for creating this framework. So we invite people to ask this question and, and, and you can close your eyes or listen from the town or city or community that you're part of. How can your city be a home to thriving people in a thriving place while respecting the well-being of all people and the health of the whole planet. So in that question, you can hear that local aspiration grounded in global responsibility. And we think this is best expressed and explored through four lenses that we call the four lenses of creating a city portrait. So the first lens would be, what would it mean to the people of your city to thrive? Who are the people of this city? their full diversity, their history, their culture, their values. Only the people of your place can say what it means to thrive there. And it's going to differ whether you're in Stockholm or Dar es Salaam, whether you're in Cape Town or Edinburgh. So that's the first lens, the local social lens. Then the local ecological question, well, what would it mean for your city to thrive in its habitat? Where is your place on the surface of Earth's planet? Where are you located? And what's nature's unique genius where you live? How does nature sequester carbon? And how does nature store groundwater after a storm? And how does nature house biodiversity there and cool the air from the treetops to the forest floor? And what would it be like for your city to mimic nature's generosity and genius there? How can our cities aspire to be long in the ecosystems of which they're a part? So these are the local aspirations. And we put this in the context of global responsibility. So wherever you are, think of all the resources that are drawn every day into your city for food, for clothing, for electronics, for construction materials. And think of all the materials, the carbon dioxide emissions, the materials that are dug up, the timber that's processed, the water that's used, the fertilizers applied, all of the resources and minerals that go into that and how could your city bring itself back within an equitable and manageable impact on planetary boundaries this of course is a massive challenge to cities of the global north that have particularly high and overshooting impacts on earth's planet and then think again of those supply chains and think of the people involved throughout those supply chains. So who stitched and sewed your clothes? Who picked and packed the food you ate for lunch? Who dug and transported the minerals that go into the buildings we create? Who assembled your electronics? So think of those workers and their communities and how do we ensure that the way we purchase and procure for our cities and places respects the labor rights and the community's rights of people worldwide. So we drew up this four lensed portrait process with our partners who you can see here on the screen with C40 Cities, with Biomimicry 3.8 and with Circle Economy. And we have had the privilege of trialing it out in several cities. So here you can see it in action in the first cities where we as a team created these city portraits for Portland, Philadelphia and Amsterdam. And these are workshops that we ran with city policymakers and local change makers. And what was really clear in each of these workshops was the benefits and the energy that came through looking at the synergy across these four lenses. Everybody at the table had a speciality, a special interest, a place where they were coming from. And they could see it on the portrait, but then they could see everything else and start drawing the connections between them and start finding new opportunities. So these were powerful workshops. But in the first three cities that I've mentioned, we as a team, Deal and C40 and Circle Economy, we created the portraits for these cities. We gathered their statistics and presented them with 
this overview. But we think there's actually a, a deeper possibility that we're really excited about that's happening now. This is, for example, the city portrait from Amsterdam. This is what it looks like on the page that we created it. And we call it the public portrait because it was put together using publicly available data and statistics. But what if the people of Amsterdam turned this from public portrait into a city selfie? What if they started by layering onto it all the interconnections that people know exist between these four very different lenses? What if they brought onto it all the ongoing initiatives that are already transforming the city? What if they brought out the people's values of what matters to people here? And those are the values that you can use to pivot from the old economy, pivoting into the new, using the values of that community in place. What if you gathered quotes and stories and histories of people who live here? What if you gathered all the initiatives and ideas that people propose? Ah, if we do something here, it can touch on that and affect that and improve that. So we believe that there's a huge energy coming from the city selfie. And then, and then we thought to ourselves, well, why not just make the whole process a city selfie? Surely the process of even gathering that data, of even creating the approach should begin within the city. So that's why we're really excited to know that places around the world have said, thank you, we're gonna take these tools and put them into practice. And we are thrilled by what we call the power of peer-to-peer -peer inspiration. So Amsterdam published the city portrait that we created with them in April. It was their highest infection rate of COVID that month. They were in COVID crisis and still they published this portrait. Why? As the deputy mayor said, well, when we begin to emerge from this emergency, where are we going to go? Who do we want to become? Which way are we going to orient ourselves? We need a vision. So we're using this to orient ourselves in the right direction. We published the methodology just a couple of months later. This is how we created that city portrait. So we made the tool open because we know there's energy and interest around the world. And we've been thrilled that since then, so many people in so many places have picked up this tool and started putting it into practice. Now, if you, if you look at that list and see yourselves there, great. If you look at that list and don't see yourselves there, please right now in the chat box, add, add, add some places for us, whether you're a town or a nation or a city or a village or a neighborhood, we'd love to know about where this is also popping up. So please just fill the chat box with information about where else this is happening. And I just want to finish by saying, of course, I've been talking here about cities, but you can see on that list alone that those aren't all cities. Some of them are nations like Curaçao, uh, Costa Rica. Some of them are towns or, or districts, Devon, the, the city, of, uh, the, the local region of Devon. So it's not just about cities. We began at the level of the city because we started working with the C40 and we focused first on the cities of the global north because we believe they have the most responsibility to move first and fastest. And that's partly why also we're focusing on cities of the global north in this webinar. But imagine donuts nested inside donuts, inside donuts, inside donuts. We can take the world. We could take a region like the European Union or a nation like Costa Rica or a state like California or a city like Amsterdam or a town like Worthing or a neighborhood like Ladywood in Birmingham. All of these places are saying, we're gonna take this framework and make it ours and put it into practice here. And of course that means innovation and adaptation, moving away from the, the simple framework that we've presented and answering those questions and exploring this through a lens that makes sense in your place. So please listen to the three cities that you're gonna to hear today, but remember that this isn't just for cities. We believe it has the potential to be adapted at all of these levels. So I'm going to finish there, but before I do, just to note that of course I'm talking about donuts uh, because most people know the shape of a donut if you say donut, but we don't have to talk about donuts everywhere. People are popping in here from countries all over the world. So as I check out, I invite you in your own language to write the name of your local ring-shaped food, whether it's a bagel or a simit uh, or a beignet, just write the name of the ring-shaped food of your country that it would make sense to call it in your culture because we want to celebrate the diversity of the ways that these ideas can come to life. So I'll stop there and I have to say I'm just so fascinated to hear uh, what we're going to hear from Cambridge and Berlin and Brussels. I don't yet know what they're going to say because we've invited these innovators to share back with us and inspire us and everybody on this webinar. So let's go. Thank you.
Thank you very much, Kate. And I, I'm just amazed to see the chat box of the different foods as well as the different places who are, it's just, it's just streaming down the page. And I think we can all see donuts within donuts within donuts or chiambelas within chiambelas within beignets within et cetera. So just wonderful. I'm going to pass, uh, please, to listen to our first presentation, which is Sebastian and Jörg, who are tuning in from Berlin to share the story of their network. Uh, so I will just say no more and pass it right over, please, when, you, when you're ready. Let me share the presentation, Andrew, please. Thank you. Awesome, thank you so much. Um, a very big welcome from, uh, from Berlin. Um, we actually wanted to start with a German expression, ein dickes Brett bohren. What, what may that mean? Well, um, it's, it's hard work to convey a development picture for the 21st century in a city, a federal state with 3.5 million inhabitants. In Germany, we call such efforts drilling a thick plank. And let us give you a bit of the Berlin context. Georg, who has been tirelessly leading this effort here over the past 18 months. Well, Georg, over to you. Thank you so much. <laughs> Welcome, everybody, also from my side. Berlin was the capital of the German Reich. It became the capital of the first socialist state on German soil but only its eastern part. 30 years after the reunification and 200 years after the birth of Karl Marx, everything that shaped German post-war history is still in effect. The left party with many votes in the eastern part of Berlin governs Berlin together with the Greens and the Social Democrats, but it has hard time becoming a motor of an ecological movement as well. Hence, we find this reminder from Karl Marx so telling as you may read. The western part of the city was the center of the student movement in the late 1960s, the origin of the Green Party. This spirit of fighting for freedom and against capitalist structures is still a motto for change throughout the city. This spirit is not only politically effective, but has also found its way into the teaching and practice of corporate culture through the free university. T campaign in 1985 already, with which high quality organically produced tea from India was sold directly to customers without any in between. The Agenda 21 movement following the Rio summit and the adoption of the Millennium Development Goals also found expression in Berlin in 2006. It is a strong expression of an integrated understanding of sustainability. Unfortunately, it was very difficult to transfer this spirit into the two-layered administration of the Berlin Senate, Department and its districts. Grassroots groups have always been active in Berlin, bringing about political and social change on their own initiative. Changing cities for cycling, uh, Circular Berlin, Food Council are examples for that. Sebastian. Thank you, Georg. And Berlin, well, we know it as poor but sexy. It has an international image that is a good place to party where everyone is free to express themselves. Yet, there is a flip side. 20% of households are below the official poverty line. The Corona crisis actually put Berlin at last in a list of 400 municipalities across Germany. In this time, a few months back, the Berlin Donut Initiative formed itself. Yeah, various grassroots actors got to know each other. 
each of whom saw in the donut model an integrating function for the aforementioned policy areas of climate protection, sustainability, and so forth. With the help of Kate Goodwin, an experienced moderator actually from Australia and now in Berlin, the core group began a process of getting to know each other and agreeing on goals and working methods. At the same time, with the preparation of a conference at the end of September, the opportunity arose to invite Jennifer Druin from Amsterdam to a kickoff meeting with the aim of getting a selected circle of stakeholders interested in the new initiative. Here is the picture from 3rd, 30th September, hashtag donut for Berlin became a reference. In parallel, contacts with Berlin institutions, Senate administrations, Chamber of Industry and Commerce, Free University were pursued or established and talks were held with the members of the government fractions responsible for sustainability from the Social Democratic Party, the Greens and the Left Party. The second workshop not only led to a proposal, but also to first working groups. For organizing the movement is a key question as we don't want to build a concurring or competing movement with a new label, but create a platform of collaboration, seeking no central authority, yet a new form of organization, which has been the potential to empower many people. And we equally seek feedback and shared learnings on this topic from the DEAL community. A further working group will now begin to work on the basics for the development of a Berlin city portrait. In all this, there are a few learnings, which Sebastian will tell you. Yeah, thank you very much, Georg. Oh, can you switch to the next one, Andrew, please? Thank you. Oh, well, with all due caution, what we can say about the experience we have gained, um, it really is all about the personal relationships and making time to build those relationships to decelerate despite the enthusiasm. We learned this as being fundamental, fundamental sorry, and actually um, also a bit the hard way. So relational leadership in matters of socioeconomic complexity is paramount. How we are together is just as important to what we do together. So it's all about enablement and building community before tackling issues. So our approach here in Berlin is a systemic one what we have to learn together, but definitely also in cooperation with the parties and the Senate, is how the systemic connections can be uncovered and used for truly sustainable development. What about other learnings? Um, we actually had a great conversation with um, Electra Columpi from Amsterdam Circular and what she shared was that the orientation dimensions for the selection of allies, because what our impulse is, is actually we, we go with the honorable intentions and it's very important for us on a grassroots level, yet political relevant power is also an important dimension that must not be missing if sustainability goals are to be achieved. And this actually may found, sound funny in this audience when we say that um, we, you should actually not mention the donut when you try to convey it. It's a little bit like the fight club, um, yet um, truly what planetary boundaries and social base have to do with each other and that economics plays a central role in determining sustainability has to be explained slowly before the enthusiasm about the donut economy can actually jump over to a broader audience. Let us jump back now here for a moment and see what other challenges we have. Georg? In the coalition agreement, the Social Democrats, the Greens and the Left Party also agreed 
to set up a roadmap after the sustainability strategy had been pursued only through boring collection of indicators. We would like to remind the political public that a view of the Berlin Parliament that is very similar to the donut economy already existed in 2006, but was not followed with much publicity. In the Berlin government, that is the Senate, it was only implemented in individual areas. We would like to achieve here too that uh, systemically effective uh, analysis is introduced. A sustainable policy must not only refer to environmental protection, as is the case in the classical sense. It must include social improvements in the sense of social justice, as well as steering companies towards goals that just at profit and cost reduction through efficiency gains. This fractalized triangle offers an orientation. If we honestly ask ourselves what we actually live on, we immediately turn to the companies and their owners or organizations that live on taxes or grants. We want to talk to the Chamber of Industry and Commerce as to especially small and medium-sized businesses. Our opinion is that indicators are absolutely necessary. They only need to be directed, directly linked to politically relevant projects that meet citizens' needs for a better life, not only economically, also those effective for the general public. This quote reminds us of the importance of reliable accounting. If, for example, in climate protection policy, the last data set is from 2016, and there are no annually billable data in the most important field of building renovation, the effectiveness of political measures cannot be evaluated and, if necessary, improved at all. One more thought on the evaluation of the social basis of the donut. It is a very high merit of Andrew and his team in Leeds to have made donut data available for all countries of the world. The set limits are certainly useful in the international context. In the at least Western European context, it would have to be considered that, for example, social inequality is expressed by transparency creating indicators. Child poverty is an example of this which has a meaning in Berlin and is not given enough attention. I would like to share a great joy on this side. As member of the Evangelical Church Berlin Brandenburg, it was very important for me that the church parliament in October decided on a new law, which passed that energy consuming entities must pay 125 euro per ton of carbon dioxide. Yeah, we're actually delighted that with Little Sun, we have a first Berlin enterprise to embrace the donut. In a country that prides itself of its efficiency and still needs to learn so much about sufficiency. Thank you so much for listening. Yeah, with that quote, we would like to um, thank you and uh, open the floor for questions. Thank you very much. Great, thank you very much, Sebastian and George, for this fascinating talk. I um, have been sharing my screen, so I would, I believe Kate has- Yes, been yes, I can jump in. I've been looking, there's been amazing questions streaming in on the Q&A chat box. Uh, so I'm gonna jump in with one from Lauren um, in Cambridge. She says, you mentioned the power in societal trans, you, you mentioned the role of power in societal transitions can you say more about your inclusion or exclusion criteria and give some examples of powerful partners that you work with or individual organizations that you refuse to work with? So it's a great question. Who's allowed to be part of this and who's not allowed to be part of this? And it's a very live question for us at Donor Economics Action Lab. Who do you say can come in and what are the criteria for involvement or exclusion? We notice that people who usually work on these subjects are highly educated people and have a certain political opinion. 
Can you use the microphone, York? Sorry. So sorry, is it now well? So we noticed that people who deal with this subject are usually highly educated and uh, have a certain political background. We are in touch with uh, the Berlin uh, citizen platform, which exists in three areas of the city where very diverse people work together to fight for their interests. And this is an example that we try to include all these kind of people. Uh, we will go to a certain district uh, of Thousand East Berlin uh, to discuss with normal citizens about these subjects. This is our way to be inclusive. Can I push that a little bit further? But are there any organizations, like if a major oil company came and said, oh, we want to be part of the Berlin Donut, uh, would you say, yeah, come in? Or, or do you have criteria at the moment that you're saying, well, hang on, you need to stand by these principles? Um, I don't think that we are on this point yet. Uh, we, we know that there are uh, companies in Berlin who work on a social basis as entrepreneurs. Uh, we would like to get to know them, but there are others who work in an ecological way, but they are not a part of it. Uh, so this is interesting. And I'm sure that the, the big sales companies uh, like Tesco in Britain, but here it is Edeka, uh, they have their uh, way dealing with, for example, uh, biological uh, nutrients. Uh, and, and we will see, uh, not to exclude someone, but to integrate them when they work according to our ideas. Great. If I could just jump in at this point, because actually this is a really important point for us at Donut Economics Action Lab. So we think the, the, the greatest risk to the donut concept is the capture and co-option and greenwashing by companies. And so just from our stance, we are setting very, very stringent uh, criteria for how and when companies can use the donut. Now I'm just talking actually to just letting everybody on the webinar know, because there's been a lot of questions popping up. How can we use it with companies? Yes, there's a real desire to use it with companies. And this is the area where we want to be the most careful and the most stringent because there's a lot of business that just sees the concept of the donut and it's like, oh, this is the cool new thing to do. So let's let's use that. And then it gets greenwashed and then it gets its value gets really undermined for everybody else. So just to let everyone know, we are creating a policy around how companies can engage with the donut. We'll be publishing it in the next couple of weeks and we'll be doing more engagement with companies in the new year. So I, I ask everyone on the webinar just to look out for that and to, to remember that we this is a, a, a a precious concept that holds a high standard and so if business wants to come to the table you've got to come on our terms we're not going to be co-opted and greenwashed so um I'll, I'll give you another question that was popping up to german to berlin are there any tools or software that you're using to connect the groups in your city together to help make them visible and connected and to organize the work in berlin this is a question from Maria. Uh, we have only started with it, but we are convinced that it works because in other areas of Germany, it had a good success uh, connecting people who work on a social basis and who are in a kind of a social movement. Uh, we also are looking for a new kind of software to publish results like indicators. We are convinced that if citizens would know about the actual status of certain subjects, if people would contribute to getting to know uh, these indicators, then they would be more integrated. And we would be really happy to share with others uh, from this big family, uh, which kind of software had been applied for that case. Yeah. Yeah, which is a great point coming to uh, uh, pointing again to accountability. So we're looking at how we can actually drive the change from the from the from the top. There are uh, there's a big motion now on a city dashboard here in Berlin, but also the grassroots, the uh, civil organizations um, and how we can use tools in order to drive uh, participation bottom up as well. And if I can last, ask a last question to you guys uh, before we move to the next group, uh, a question from Lorenzo. 
Um, he says, I'm Italian. My question is how to attract the attention of the government. Now, this is a really great question because uh, just to run backwards, whoop, somebody's coming in my room, child. I'm, I'm in the middle of talking to quite a lot of people. Um, the, 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 the portraits that we did with Portland and Philadelphia and Amsterdam, we did with the city government. So it began with the city government. It's more sort of top down. Now you guys are beginning as change makers, community members. So how do you engage the government? And so that is definitely um, a million uh, dollar euro, whatever currency you take um, question. And um, we do not have uh, the answer yet. What we are um, trying to do is we're trying to create basically um, a bracket so um, and and we're using the effects that are that are that are happening in between so we're we're nudging um, officials here in the in the in the city as well as uh, driving and we have one member Nicole Hartmann who is specifically driving this effort is to make this a bottom-up movement but as we all know bottom of movements are driven by two main factors, which one is being, um, you actually polarize, and the other one is you make it personal. And that is not really the philosophy of the, of the donut. So making it that, that classic street movement is, is, a, is a challenge. And we're very much looking forward to also um, sharing learnings um, in the deal community um, on that. But it's really, it's like a political campaign on the top. You have to just talk to stakeholders, nudge them and never be tired. Just go on, go on, go on. Brilliant, I think we need to move on, but I'm just gonna say if anybody- It's the last year of our coalition. And uh, in that year, they have to perform and they have not yet performed on sustainability. So we are in touch with the Senate for Environment, uh, which performs now, and we are sure that we can add the donut on top of it. And that is also the interest of the Green Party. Great, and if I could add in there in New Zealand, and they, they had a national election recently, and there's an organization there called Donut Economics Advocates in New Zealand, and they held uh, a donut dialogue for the for the politicians standing for all the different parties and they invited them to the event and said how does your political party and your manifesto help bring us into the donut so there's an idea if you've got a political moment coming up it's a great idea so i'm going to hand back to andrew but if anybody has ideas from where they are about how to connect with and attract and engage government please do pop them in the chat box we've we're going to keep all this chat and learn so much from it yeah excellent uh thank you very much sebastian and Jörg for sharing just the, the legacy of what's been happening in, in Berlin, as well as your learnings, as well as how you were formed is really, really informative and really, really inspiring. And best of luck with all of your efforts. And of course, we'll be in touch. Uh, so Thank now with, with, without further ado, I'd like to hand over to Katie Thornborough and Clara Todd, who are joining us from Cambridge. The floor is yours. Hello. I'll start sharing my screen. Can everyone hear me okay? Can you hear me? Yes, yes. Okay. Excellent. And Sebastian, yeah. Next slide, please. Great, hi. So this is Katie and I'm Clara and we're from the Cambridge Donut Economics Action Group or CAMDIAG. Katie is a city councillor and was central to the development of the group. And me, I, Clara, is a resident, a web app developer and one of the coordinators for the group. We're both really honoured to be part of this event and really excited to be involved with Donut Economics. Our group has only been around for a few short months, but we have grand ambitions. We want to make Cambridge a safe and just space for humanity. In this presentation, we'll talk about Cambridge, how CAMDIAG formed, our guiding principles, and where we think we're going. So Cambridge. Cambridge is a lovely place to live. You can get around by bicycle really easily. It's very leafy and green. The buildings of Cambridge colleges dominate the centre of town, and luckily, they're mostly very beautiful. But why is it that in 2017, 47 deaths in Cambridge, or 
oh, hang on, could be attributed to particular air pollution, most likely caused by emissions from diesel engines and stationary traffic in and around the city. Cambridgeshire has one of the fad, fastest growing economies and populations in Britain, with a 22% increase in population predicted between 2010 and 2031. There has been a building boom, with many greenfield sites built over to provide housing and workspaces for the new industries. So, why is it that some people have struggled to feed themselves over the last six months, traveling across town to queue up at one of the many new food hubs for well over an hour at a time? And why is it that many people who grew up in Cambridge can't afford to live here anymore? It's prosperous for some. And then of course, despite all of this prosperity, there are some things that we can't easily buy our way out of no matter how successful our economy is. Too little water, the growing demand for support of Cambridge's incredible growth is putting pressure on the chalk streams and the aquifer. Among many terrible effects, it impacts biodiversity in our area. Too much water, land and property in and around Cambridge will be underwater or flooding more regularly in a few decades with rising sea levels and the changing climate plenty of people here know just how fragile things are socially and environmentally. We just needed to find each other and turn from despair to transformative action, have a project to crystallize our efforts. Without yet using the language of donor economics, there are many regenerative projects in Cambridge focused on moving this city into the sweet spot of a safe and just space for humanity. We've all come to see that the donut model provides greater visibility and interconnectedness of the groups within a complex system. Cambridge is very ready for the Cambridge donut, but getting it off the ground does require leadership and support. I'll hand over to Katie now to talk about her journey as an ally and as a leader at the Cambridge City Council. As a city councillor, I've been able to set my planning policies for sustainability and equality. It includes biodiversity crisis, water, climate emergency, inequality, places of work, health and well-being, and I also wanted to include the UN Sustainable Development Goals. These were accepted by my fellow councillors in March this year. Many of my planning priorities are already feeding into the main themes of our next local plan, but I was uncertain how to incorporate the UN Sustainable Development Goals. Our next local plan is due to be adopted in 2024. Could the UN sustainability goals be fed into a Cambridge donut? We were struck by COVID. It has changed everything. It has made a huge impact. As a councillor, I've had to reconsider my city level concerns and actually focus on hyperlocal and my ward. I've been involved in a local food hub where many people have come to ask, how can we help? What can we do? But also many people came to ask for help and also assistance. And an amazing thing has happened much of the community has come together stronger than before. And the mutual aid groups have been formed across the city and are quite outstanding. They have come together because there was a crisis. Residents wanted to help and they had the technology and skills to enable this amazing thing to happen. During the shutdown, 
another amazing thing happened. Kate Rayworth and Donut Economics fed into the really inspiring Amsterdam City Donut. I wondered whether aspects of this could feed into a hyperlocal donut or initiative started by the Mitchell Aid Groups within Cambridge. At the same time, other people were inspired by the Amsterdam City Donut. A group of our residents from the University of the Third Age were asking, how can we use this for Cambridge? Other councillors were asking, can we be a more equal city? These questions and initiatives and the idea about a possible hyperlocal initiative has fed into our initiative of the Cambridge Donut Group. Thank you. Great. Great. So Camdiac has grown from a handful of individuals in the summer to well over 40 members, some incredibly strong, dedicated people who are really moving things forward. We are the team that's building the portrait, the tools, making the connections, liaising between all the different actors that are involved in regenerative action and also the decision makers. Told you we were ambitious. We are doctors, artists, academics, entrepreneurs, teachers, and engineers. Some have never been involved in community action and some are seasoned activists. We're young people, parents and grandparents, and the mix of ages and perspectives make us a really strong group right now. And I am hopeful for what we can do. There are challenges, sure. Collective group decisions are hard. We're plugging and connecting with communities directly where we can and going by way of other organizations when we can't. We are facing a crisis, climate change and snowballing inequality. Mutual aid groups do spring into existence often in the face of crises to fill in gaps. The COVID-19 pandemic is a crisis. Many of us have experienced the creative power of mutual aid groups from the inside. And that's where the energy and the fire comes from. We're digital. Everyone works online now, of course. Online tools allow us to collaborate, communicate and move fast. And some tools are new for many people in the group but we put in the time to support, help, and ensure everyone has access. As we strive for equity for all the people in Cambridge, it's natural we strive for it within the group. Emergent, our group is non-hierarchical and everyone is free to create working groups and around any issue that issues it interests them. Many of our members have other associations and connections, more co-creation will emerge. Art. As we come out of lockdown and restrictions are loosened, we are preparing to engage with the community in physical space. We're planning some exciting collaborations with artists working in the community, ready to roll with pop-up conversation stands in the city, our donut stops. We are learning how to communicate about this stuff and art will be essential. As we learn from the residents, groups, and local authorities through different data streams, conversations, and workshops, we'll construct the Cambridge Donut City Portrait, which will be online. The digital donut will be an attractive and accessible interactive tool for local individuals and organizations to learn how the city is performing in each of the social and ecological dimensions. Stories, official targets, resident defined oh hang on resident defined targets initiatives as well as cold hard metrics 
will be embedded in it. We imagine it will change over time. We'd love to co-create the digital donut with other city groups as the tools will be open source, transferable and useful everywhere. So back to Cambridge, in different parts of our city, people have different experiences and face different challenges. It was an amazing feat to scale the donut from world, nation to city, but can we drill down smaller? The 10 most deprived areas in Cambridge are in the north and northeast of the city, and some are in the UK's 10% most deprived. Perhaps the city portrait is not granular enough. Let's go smaller. We want to know what's going on lower down within wards and inside communities. Our action group is formed at grassroots level and as explained, we are working towards a city portrait through our residents and communities. It is work very much in progress. Can we enable our communities to use these tools to understand our actions locally, globally, environmentally, and socially, and change our futures? Can we enable schools or a food hub, a business or street? We're looking at collaborating with other organizations in Cambridge and also the region around Cambridge. Can we inspire them, a college, a university, a charity, or the council to do the donut? Can we create the city portrait from our grassroots initiatives? Donuts all the way down or up? Our work in progress has challenges. We want to co-create with communities most affected, but recruiting the people right now that can connect best in the communities is important to get right. We need resources, time and money. All of us are working as volunteers to get this off the ground. Some of us have been working almost full time on it while others put in what time they can. Funding is being considered and sought. Also a challenge is the support and convincing those who matter. Who benefits most in maintaining the status quo in the short term? We need them to address the issues, use tools that are available and change course. Convincing those who know the size of the issues facing us to not give up, to feel that they can make a difference. Convincing those immediate challenges to know, those immediately challenged to know that it's not their fault. This is the system that is at fault, not them. And progress. We know this is a long-term project the first portraits will probably not be ready for six months, others way longer, depending on capability and support. And then we need to keep going. Five years, 10 years, 20 years, think in generations. For our group, our work in progress, we ask, can we do the donut? And the answer is always, yes, we can. Thank you. Great, thank you so much for that really, really, really magnificent presentation by both of you uh, and for sharing just the context as well as the challenges and the opportunities really at a, at a super local level. Um, Kate, did you catch any? Uh... Yep, there is so many questions flying in now. Um, so um, I'm just gonna jump in with one from Anna Ferretto. She says, hi, if I were the mayor of the city, what could I do for the global aspects of the donut framework so that global responsibility I presented both on the social side and the ecological side she says I can think of many actions to apply to stay within the donut locally but what can a mayor do to improve the situation on the global side uh, such as on the supply chain it'd be great to hear from you just ideas if, if things have already come up uh, in Cambridge around what could you do to take responsibility to that global impact of your city can I pick that one Clara yeah absolutely yeah well I think here in Cambridge, we're thinking that when we don't want to, we're not going to wait for our national government or regional government where there is a mayor. We decided that we're going to get on with it now and um, really speak out by action to take these on board and, and enable people, the, our residents and those um, to 
actually use the donor and make a difference. And we think that the, this grassroots will inspire the, um, lo the local politicians like me and my colleagues. We, we've all, we already know that this is happening and we definitely, definitely want to work with our residents on this. And then as a city, I would like to show the, the other cities around this that it is, this is really important and that it can be done and then show the, the regional mayor that um, the, the, this is happening um, and they must take note. And then hopefully the, that um, this greater Cambridge region, hope it may be known that it's the, the, we've got to listen to the residents because they, they want this. And we're gonna hit that environmental ceiling and smash it. Great, and I'll just supplement a little bit there. The city of Amsterdam has set itself the goal of becoming a 100% circular city by 2050. So they're saying they need to be, they need to halve the, the use of new materials by 2030. That's a phenomenal ambition. And suddenly it kicks into action all sorts of questions about the circular use of construction materials and their food supply chain. And how do we create a circular city here? So that's one part of reducing that, that global footprint, but also through city mm -hmm. procurement. Great, uh, Katie, I'm gonna direct this one to you again. Um, M. Storley has this question. How do you use the donor as an integrated part of city planning with all the other programs and targets that you also have to consider? When talking to politicians, I've noticed that they tend to get nervous about applying yet another set of aims as they've already got to do the SDGs and local variations of that. So how do you convince them? How do you convince your colleagues and maybe Clara, how do you convince your community that using the donut will be constructive and not just another layer? Well, I, the, the, the main themes that we have tested with our residents already are to do with the, the climate crisis and biodiversity and well-being. We, we have to ensure that they are considered for every single policy going forward. And that the image of the donut is a, a really good way to consider this. So our planning, senior planning officers, they all know about the donut. And as we collect information, we want to put it in the format of a, of a donut so it's, we can consider that. But the grassroots, the, the grassroots working that is, is I'm trying to encourage and is happening makes a real difference because we know that we must speak to our residents. They have to have trust in us at the city level and then further up. So we need to enable them to say what they need to thrive as a city. And that's why Clara and the group are working so well. Great, and then, then I'm gonna grab one more question from here. So from Lauren. Uh, many cities like Cambridge don't exist in isolation, of course, but have a rural hinterland of people who contribute to and draw from the city, but whose views may be different from those in the city. And I think Lauren may be uh, coming from a place saying, you know, people, some, some people are residents who live in the city, but then others come in and out every day and work there, or others are supplying the food and the small enterprises from the rural community around. How can you take account of their interests and needs in a place-based uh, initiative like this. So what is their place in this, she asks. Do you want to answer that, Clara? Oh, okay. Well, with, within our group, um, we definitely want to hear people that have associations with Cambridge, that uh, work in Cambridge, that live around Cambridge. It's even though we're calling it the Cambridge Donut, um, we realize that people have interactions with the city in different ways. Of course, we're going to talk with them. And of course, they should. We need to hear their views. Hopefully where they are, you know, we want our tools to be so ubiquitous. It's just so exciting to be part of the donor economics and see how the site has grown and the platform has grown. Because it would be so nice if these tools were ubiquitous and people could create the donuts from their own perspective in their own places and then link them all up together. You know, it's a big, beautiful, complicated system and it would just be wonderful to see that. In fact, the wall hanging right behind you, Clara, just seems to exemplify that endless deep interconnection of different scales. Mm. I'm sure that's not just coincidence. Um, and I wanted to say that the picture you showed of all the pe people have made these big donuts and decorated them and had their face. I think you've just invented a brilliant community tool right there. 
because that was beautiful. So I'm going to hand back to Andrew. Great, yes, and I can just echo, uh, thank you for, for the wonderful presentations and for answering. And it's been really inspiring to hear what's already been created and the challenges and opportunities and how to take it forward. And I'm sure that you've inspired many others. So I'm going to continue moving on and please invite our, our friends in Brussels to, to take the floor when they're ready. So please, Laure and Tristan. Hello, everybody. We are very happy to be here. And yeah, to, to hear, to, to tell you a bit more about the Brussels Donut Project. Uh, we started last, last summer, at the end of last summer. But the first thing I wanted to say, it's just amazing to hear the experience of you, from you uh, in Berlin and Cambridge, to see and to learn from the differences in the way of approaching the donut downscaling. So yeah, really, I'm really excited about yeah, hearing those, those new thoughts and we, we're going to, to discuss with, with other colleagues about this. A few words about Brussels to explain how we got there and with whom. Um, the, the question of economic transition is really at the heart of the political program of the Brussels region. Uh, the government has expressed a real desire to make concrete changes especially with people in the field. So they decided to finance a consortium made up of deal, uh, conferences of which Tristan and I are part, and ISHEC, which is a Brussels management school. Uh, this was for the kind of exploratory phase. Uh, and the question is, how could the donut be used in Brussels to accelerate the transition? Uh, so we have a significant collaboration with some politicians in Brussels, with administration also, uh, but it's mostly a bottom-up work because a lot of people are already working on more sustainability for Brussels. Uh, and we want to connect with them and to include them in the project since we don't want to have a kind of exclusivity on the donuts thinking, of course. So we, we just started the process and we really welcome uh, everyone to yeah just to, to connect and to discuss how we could work more together and for those unfamiliar maybe with the administrative uh, intricacies of Belgium know that when we talk about Brussels we are talking about the region which is a bit more than the city uh, but yeah it's a bit complicated <laughs> it's Belgium <laughs> so what is our goal in, uh, in for the for the donut in Brussels, uh, of course we want to adapt the donut to to our region, which means to have a framework to help us collective to collectively imagine the future of the region, and to take uh, decisions coherent decisions in the direction of a just and safe uh, transition. Uh, this to adapt the donut to the Brussels region means also to make the donut economy a compass for a large number of actors, not only politicians, but also actors in the field. So what are we going to get from this process? Since we are now, uh, we, we are very lucky, we are financed until April. Uh, so uh, it's only, of course, the first phase. Uh, then other actors, hopefully, will take the, the rest also of the, of the work to be, to be done. So um, what are we going to get? Uh, first, uh, participatory portraits of key Brussels issues. So it will be technically documented and also collectively loaded with meaning. Uh, and it will be both descriptive and perspective. But Tristan is going to, to explain a bit more uh, on that afterwards. Then second uh, output, let's say, uh, it's a kind of guide for analysis and for action um, for administrations and all stakeholders in the region. Thirdly, we want to build a community, a network of actors, uh, sharing, willing to share the donut approach uh, and also implementing uh, the donut in its actions. It won't be a new community since, as I told before, a lot of people are already working 
for the a more sustainable uh, region in Brussels. But we want to, to build on existing networks and, and forces also. Um, maybe a word on one of our specificities in Brussels, but I hear that in Cambridge and Berlin also, it's at the, the, it's at the core of the project. So we have chosen to really uh, co-create our results and methodologies. It means uh, not just asking citizens, for example, for their opinion, but really working with them along the way, exactly as you do in, in Berlin and in, uh, in Cambridge also. So yeah, it was just a few words of introduction, but now I leave the floor to, to Tristan to explain a little more precisely how we decided to, to work. Thank you and hello everyone. So yeah, we, with the team we've been putting uh, some thought into how to adapt the donut framework to make it something both federative and operational um, for all actors of the um, and, and, and for regional administrations in particular uh, to, to, to be useful while giving a, a central role to co-creation uh, in the process. So I'll present the, the approach we came up with uh, in Brussels. And as I do, I'll also share our current uh, questions and, and the issues that we face regarding what we are doing. Um, and of course, we would uh, be really interested in having comments and, and reactions uh, on this. So we decided uh, um, to work along two main paths, which have been uh, initiated in, in parallel, but uh, which are meant to be crossing each other and mutually nourishing. Our first path uh, is uh, the, the regional portrait. It is the one most directly associated with the donut as such, as the aim here is to situate the Brussels region regarding all of the dimensions that form both the social foundation and the ecological sailing. So we, we don't open up the four lenses uh, at this point. Here, the portrait sticks to the global ecological and the local social sides of things. This is for us a kind of a logical consequence of the complementarity between our two paths, uh, as I will explain, with the second one diving into uh, the donut through the four lenses, rather than focusing on the donut boundaries, which is uh, more the case with this uh, first one. So to draw this portrait, we work on uh, collecting and formatting diverse uh, sources of statistical information in partnership with local administrations. And this portrait could be just that, uh, a purely quantitative uh, exercise. But we also want this portrait, as Laura said, to be meaningful for the people of Brussels and therefore to make room for a wider public participation in its construction. And so, such participation would be particularly relevant uh, regarding the targets for the social dimensions in particular, as these targets should be collectively agreed on uh, if they are to be meaningful. Um, we are still in the process of building the practical modalities of particip participation to the regional portrait, but this has already raised uh, many questions to us like how to make this portrait truly uh, participatory without this participation uh, being a mere uh, consultation, let's say, on each and every of the 21 dimensions that form the donut, and while at the same time recognizing that uh, selecting indicators is already fundamentally political in itself. And more broadly, how can the downscaling exercise itself and its various hypothesis be questioned and uh, collectively discussed uh, because the methodological choices that, that we have to make to build the portrait raise questions of distributive justice, for example, when we decide on the parameters for the allocation uh, of the fair share of the region regarding resources, for example. So these are more uh, technical issues, but they should be uh, collectively addressed as well. The second entry uh, that we work on is the situational one. So we think it is the most uh, original as we propose a novel method, the donut joint investigation, as we call it. The idea is to take situations uh, as starting points. And by situations here, we mean uh, actual socioeconomic issues existing today in Brussels 
and the wrong which inhabitants, users, activists, uh, administrations, all kinds of actors can be gathered and whose choices will affect uh, the transition pathway of the region. So what we do here is to bring the donut philosophy and tools into these situations in order to analyze them on a larger spectrum than what would have been done uh, following uh, a traditional cost-benefit analysis. This joint investigation is based on the four lenses with the guiding question of how does the situation affect each of the four lenses or could contribute to them if uh, it doesn't already. So the aim uh, is to use the donut as a tool for public decision making and to develop a methodology that would be easily usable uh, by actors and by administrations uh, in particular. So we are just starting to head that way, but um, here again, we find ourselves challenged uh, in many ways when we are practicing the donut uh, with, with the actors. Um, for example, just to, to share some thoughts, um, it appeared that the four lenses could be perceived by participants as kind of dividing reality too much while they recognized uh, the many interdependencies uh, existing throughout the four lenses. So something we are um, uh, exploring now is to redesign the four lenses for them not to be like four boxes with clear boundaries between them, but uh, to get to something much more like a compass with four cardinal points and continuity between them on a 360 degree span. We feel it could uh, open up some more conceptual space while also retaining the donut philosophy, which is to be uh, holistic. Also for us, the four lenses should be uh, navigated with many elements in mind as uh, guides for, for thinking. The so seven uh, donut economics principles and the multiple elements of the embedded economy uh, in particular. So at first, uh, we tried to introduce these various elements to the participants of our workshops, but it appeared to be uh, a lot to be properly assimilated. So we still have to find the right balance on how much to bring conceptually for the work on the four lenses to be uh, sufficiently informed uh, without kind of overwhelming participants with all the richness uh, of, of donut uh, economics. So that's it for the, for the big picture of the Brussels approach for now. Uh, thanks for inviting us. It's a, it's a very great event and we're looking forward to hear from everyone here. Thank you very much, Laure and Tristan. It's really, really interesting to hear just how almost a different direction from which, from which the Brussels project really started from being driven by the, by the government where, as opposed to the other cities we've heard so far. I'm going to uh, believe Kate is on top of the question and answers which have been rolling in as before. So please. Yeah, so um, a question from Fanny. Do you think there's enough research data on social and economic and ecological uh, facts locally to map the current situation for the donut transition or how are you including participatory and action research as part of this transition and I'm, I'm glad to ask this to you because I know it's at the heart of your philosophy of engagement. Oh, sorry, you just if you, to, if you want to answer, you have to switch off. Your... Yeah, sorry. <laughs> so there, there's a lot of data that we, we can use for this portrait. And um, I, I think the, the, the issue is not so much in the, in the quantity of data that we could use, but really on the, on the choices that we have to make to, cho to choose which indicator to use for this particular, for every particular domain uh, uh, covered by, by, the, by the donut. And, um, as, as for our project, we, we don't have, um, we're not going to create new data, so there won't be any new kind of action, re action research around creating data. We try to make sense of, of all available data to, to make something which is uh, accessible by everyone else and, and to, to, to be the basis for um, uh, uh, choices around which uh, indicators, which figures we should uh, put forward as it makes the most sense uh, regarding the Brussels uh, context. And maybe I would like to add that while collecting data, 
for the portrait, for example, we also can show <laughs> where the data are missing. Because of course, there are numerous data in, in Brussels for a bit everything. But maybe since we're working also with the, the administration uh, having in charge the, 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 the collection and, and also the creation of new data, uh, we also want to, to show maybe on some specific issues, qualitative issues, would be interesting to develop new uh, to, to, to get more information, more statistical information, because since the government is not informed, uh, statistically uh, informed, it's not possible to make uh, decisions. So that's also the, one of the, the aim of our portrait, to show where things are and information are missing. Great. And then a question, uh, again, that connects to one I asked to Katie in Cambridge about how this connects with other ongoing local plans. So a Patrick, question from Patrick. How will the Brussels Donut be connected with the city's circular economy plan? Known to be quite elaborated already and ambitious, is there going to be duplication or redundancy or a, an incoherence? It's a very interesting question because we are we are working on that uh, on that with the with the people in charge also of this this specific plan, but with other ones also because since we said as we said at the beginning we don't want to add an extra tool or an extra idea saying oh gosh we have the great idea <laughs> we're going to say everything and to, to give you the right direction it's absolutely not our point so many very good things are are going on in brussels so we 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 see more the donut as as a kind of framework and we would like people to open their eyes to the new dimension uh, presenting the donut but maybe missing in their specific plans. So that's why we're working with the administration. Um, and there is currently uh, in, in Brussels a reflection on the organization of those all those plans, which is um, uh, yeah, a, a kind of strategic, uh, a new strategic tool, uh, taking all those plans together. And so we're working with them in order to see how the donuts can, uh, can be added and can, uh, can work uh, coherently uh, with, with those. Great. And I'm going to make up a question because you said um, we want to try not, not dividing the portrait into those four boxes, right? That sort of somehow to seem to separate life. Completely agree. Life doesn't happen in separate boxes. And of course, the reason we created those is to make sure that those four issues are, are covered and not forgotten but you're bringing them back together in, in a kind of compass or 360 degrees. That sounds great. And I, and I just want to say to all, all of the cities and everybody online, the tools that we've supplied so far are just version one, iteration one, ready to go, have a, have a go. But what, what's exciting is when people say, mm, we think we could draw this another way or innovate and let's create new canvases that can work better and better. I wanted to ask you a question about trialing out these tools in the time of COVID. How, we, I mean, the, the natural way that we like to tend to bring communities together is get in a room, sit at a table, connect with each other and draw on a, sh on a shared piece of paper. How are you planning or already doing this? And this is a question for everybody. How are you doing this in a, in a time and creating that connection when everything is having to be online? Yes, so uh, of course we, we moved online, as everyone, I guess. Um, and we've been thinking a lot about the tools um, we should use to, to create this feeling of uh, participatory work and collective work being, being together um, around uh, the same tools, uh, using them. Um, so, yeah, we, we, we used uh, interactive uh, collaboration tools uh, on which we kind of recreate uh, the post-it system uh, on, on which everyone can uh, write up elements. For, for example, um, we, use the, we use this for, for the four lenses, um, in inviting everyone to think about um, the, the situation which was uh, studied at the moment regarding those four lenses and adding elements uh, inside those four lenses. That's something we did. Um, also, on the basis of the embedded economy uh, diagram, which is very rich and uh, we, we think it, it can really be the basis for uh, fruitful thinking. Um, so, yeah. Great. Maybe yeah, please, uh, jump in. 
Thanks. Uh, uh, just a word about uh, on what you said uh, before about the the fact that we yeah we we use the, the tools and then we, we try to adapt them. Um, it's it's very important for for us and and it's exactly how we we understood the the, the tools. But especially because we we decided to work with the people in the situation, people living in Brussels. And so for them, donut is not like a, a very sacred uh, things that we cannot touch. No, it's it's really a working. And we want to, we want to, to, to work with, with real people in real situation for, for that reason, for that specific reason. Um, so yeah, it's it's important and we, we, we will be very happy to, to share if we, we find good ideas that could be shared with other cities, of course, we will uh, let them know. Uh, I think, yeah, it's, it's a point. And we would also be interested in knowing how other cities, uh, what they think about the way we adapt the, the tools. Great. I'm going to hand back to Andrew. Thank you so much. Great. Yes. Thank you so much. So we have some time uh, left in the rest of the session, and I was I'm really looking forward to inviting all of the all of our presenters back. Uh, so if you're able to turn on your videos, that would be great. And I've, if I look at the question and answer box, I believe we have 70 questions. So we it looks like we'll have more than enough in order to keep ourselves busy for the next until the end of the session. Uh, I've actually been picking out some questions that apply across all of the teams. I've been holding them to bring back now. So oh, that's great. OK, well, if those speakers who are able to turn their cameras back on again just to participate, then that would be wonderful. And and let's kick off the 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 general questions that Kate has in store. Great. So. These are just questions that are, are relevant to all cities and you don't all have to answer all of them. But of course, if you if you feel like you want to jump in, please do. So the first one is from Eva. She says, I've not heard yet about any explicit alliances with universities and academic institutions working on sustainable economics, but they could provide a lot of interesting knowledge and data. So is, is that an interesting avenue to explore? And is there something already going on? Of course, you're all based in cities with amazing universities. so. Is there something there? So in Cambridge, obviously, we have uh, two really great universities, both with uh, sustainability institutes. Well, so ARU is a sustainability institute. And uh, one of our uh, very dynamic members is uh, currently doing a PhD or finishing off a PhD there. Um, and uh, yeah, so we're hoping to have more links. We've also talking to the university to, um, and yeah, just really wanting to deepen the ties. And um, we've had preliminary uh, uh, conversations with them, but we really hope to deepen those, those relationships because obviously that would be awesome. We, we're not working specifically with the with the universities or centers or research centers on sustainability but what's important I think is to to pick up the person where they are uh, in biology or human science or because I think that the, the reflection on the sustainability and the the capability to to add new new ideas new things uh, on the donut thinking could come from any other technical uh, also uh, universities or, or centers so yeah in, in our case uh, we, we're working with people uh, coming from from various departments uh, but yeah they are always uh, welcome to to join uh, and to work with us Okay, I'm going to ask the big money question. So several people have asked, well, where's the money going to come from this? So Robert says, I'd like to know how the cities are going to finance this model. Is it self-sustainable? Does it use taxpayers' money? Does it need new budgets? Can, be, can it be done within existing budgets? So let's put the money on the table. How do these things get paid for? When we started discussion with politicians, uh, how the donut could fly, uh, it was very clear that within the next year, uh, before the election, it will be very difficult to get additional money from public sources. But uh, as the Green Party is really interested to install it in their policies, uh, they say, well, in the next legislative period, 
uh, if it would start to fly, they would put some money, public money, uh, for the initiative to work on. Um, yeah, that's my answer. Clara, please. So I can't answer for the long term, but I know that there are some grants. There's um, various grants that we, we've been applying for recently. Um, and then, of course, there's a lot of volunteer graft, hard graft going on. Um, but I really don't know what's going to happen, you know, funding long term. Um, but yeah, hopefully we've got some grants coming our way. Katie, can I ask you from your perspective from within the council, do, does this need new money or is it that there's money that this is about priorities and how money is mm. spent? Yeah, we've, well, we, we like many local authorities are under huge pressure, but one of the things we're trying to do is actually get officer time allocated so that when the Cambridge DAG is really up and running, that we could be a strategic partner with them so that we, we, we do not want to take over what they're doing it's very important that they are running this show and we work with them and hopefully we'll there with other part big partners like the university will also be a strategic partner the right partners at the right time and we've we've got a couple of grants we've encouraged them to apply for but also looking elsewhere so that the city council can be ready so that the, the, the data that we've got can be used by Cambridge DAG and also as they collect information that will feed into the information we've got for our next local plan. Yes, for, for Brussels, the, the question was a bit different since we decided that it was, we, we, had, we had to do something, we had to change something and so the the fact that they decided to to finance uh, a team of people to to think about it and to to answer uh in a i mean to start to answer uh is, is the first way to, to yeah to answer your question maybe but we don't have the the choice and yeah it's maybe it's it's the question of thinking how we could save money from another uh, I mean, yeah, for, from a, another funding and then to take it and to, to use it for for this transition, uh, we, we have we have to do it. Great, another big question. So um, Carl asks this, since we're going away from traditional cost benefit analyses, so, so we're not using sort of, you know, creating shadow prices of what's the cost of a project, what's the benefit of a project, shall we do it? So, so how then are initiatives prioritized here? Is it in terms of their potential effectiveness on coming back with an ecological ceiling or how do you, how do you balance that with improving basic social needs? What kind of indicators um, would you be using and how would you compare them one to another, one initiative to another in order to take action? Anybody want to jump in on, on that one? Yeah, I can, I can try to give some elements on this. Um, for, first, um, the, the cost-benefit uh, analysis method is is very uh, it has a, been implemented for a long time. It's very codified, uh, well theorized, um, and uh, it, it, it has kind of an argument uh, of authority in regarding economics perspective. So um, it's it's a first challenge to bring something else. Uh, which um, is seen as having uh, such uh, not a, an authority but a, a legitimacy um, in kind of a, a method to 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 analyze projects. Um, so that's what we are trying to to, to build um, through the situations that we are studying um, right now, uh, and it's a, it's an output that we hope to to be able to to build um, what we. What we what we can feel to in the direction that it's uh, taking uh, in terms to to answer directly to to the question of priorities in selecting the projects, um, I, I think to to think through the four lenses and the donut really give us a sense uh, of whether a project is pointing towards the, the, the right direction or not. Is it going uh, in the direction of the safe and just uh, space of the donut or not? So I think it's it's already a, a qualitative uh, qualitative feel that we can have uh, of competing competing projects, 
And if we have to objectify things uh, maybe more, pre or more precisely, well, the, the, more, the more dimensions of the donut it, it participates to, the, the better it is. So yeah, so that's some first uh, thoughts on, on this. Many others, yes, Katie, please. I think one one thing that we're finding is that people who are uh, small uh, individuals and organizations are much more used to looking at their carbon footprint and the environmental impacts of their actions or their organizations but the 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 environmental and the biodiversity impact of our actions um some people assume that it, it will if we deal with climate crisis it will deal with the environmental crisis but by uh, using the donor, it clearly shows that this is not necessarily the case. And the other thing uh, that I find is it's, it's as an individual, I've, it's, I try to think locally and globally and on the environmental issues, it's really difficult to try and assess where I am about my impact on society um, locally in, in, and definitely globally in a measured way. And we want to try and improve things, but using the donut is just such a, a great image. And um, as the as the data builds up, I as an individual can really understand my impact. And then, but then, but again, working with the others in our group, we will we will enable other people to do this really simply and really think broadly, which is so important. And then again, the the organizations want to consider well-being now well-being is really important but again how do you how do you assess it how do you know where we've got to and how do you make sure that that is incorporated and a priority in every decision so that we don't make things worse and i think this is the tool to enable that great Gil, please what i learned from the amsterdam example is that uh, projects were analyzed according to the outer circle uh, and according to the inner circle and a lot of lines were drawn between so if you find projects that have more relations to different subjects i would say they are worth following it and th this was my point with talking about indicators indicators are only looking on a simple or a specific subject and sometimes they have even a uh, yeah, on a lower level, more indicators for one subject that will not help us politically. Uh, when we want to be successful in political terms, we have to address projects that fulfill a lot of different aspects. That, that is according to the policy sphere. What we tried to uh, tell to the audience is with this fractal approach. The, the usual way which was addressed, that is uh, cost-benefit analysis. That is the way people think of profitability in this lower economic section. But you can have a look in the ecologic uh, corner in this section uh, to think in the same way. How would a project improve environment and what it would it cost in environmental terms to do it? And you could ask on the social uh, triangle uh, as well. And then you would start to connect that with each other. Uh, and that is the way, Kate, that you have introduced in your video on enterprises, uh, how enterprises could enter into this new sphere, not only look on profit, but on these other dimensions. And there are like big corporations, organizations that help, and this is a uh, social economy uh, in Germany as well. And I think you have them in Belgium in a similar way. Great, thanks. So I'm gonna ask um, everybody listening to answer this question in the chat box. Paul Scholes is saying, if you don't have paper and pens and sticky notes on a wall, can people share in the chat box, what's your favorite app or tools or online system for mapping the lenses? For, for sharing community information. I've had experience using Miro, but I'm sure there's many others and I'm sure we could all be helped by hearing from each other in the chat box. Just what have you found as good online tools for collaboration, making things visual? So please answer that question in the chat box. And I'm now gonna ask our panelists another question. Um, a question from Chema. 
He says, how do you deal in your city, whether it with individuals or households or communities, the people who are consuming and living way beyond the donuts limits, who are the ones who are living very, very high impact lifestyles. So first of all, in the global north, let's recognize that's nearly all of us because of the way that global north consumption is constructed. But there are within cities, there are some people and communities who live very, very high impact lifestyles. How, it's just a really interesting question. How, how do you or would you engage them in these conversations? I really believe that um, uh, people need to, uh, I, I think people need the information about their lifestyles and they, they really understand the impact. And the donut is such a great way because you can see it. You don't, you, it just, it very, very quickly you can understand it. Children can understand it. Grandparents can understand it. And, um, and it, it inspires you to try and do something different. So I, you know, it, the organizations need to be inspired by it. And we need to, the, they, the, the people, the 10% or the 1% who use so much, they have to come to grips with what they're doing and just change. and. I, I'm this, you know, with there's so much to be depressed about at the moment, but I think this is a, a real light in, in the middle of the donut or whatever. It's it's inspiring, and I'm really hope that they can look at that for, regarding themselves and set the, and make them change. Anyone else want to jump in? Yeah, yeah. Laura, go for it. Hi, I'd just like to make a small point because this is definitely something that we're we're really struggling with at the people that. Um, benefit the most right now from the inequality who are right at the top, who are really big consumers. I guess what what's the challenge? Like how how can we how can we convince them that they need to, you know, they're colonizing the future? No, that that what they're doing and how they're treating everything is going to be impacting. You know, obviously they're very comfortable right now, but you know, surely what about their children and their children's children and their children's children's children? Um, you know, how like even if they're purely selfish and just thinking, you know, well, I'm all right, you know, I'm I'm going to be uh um you know wrapped in cotton wool, I'm going to be um away from all of this, it doesn't affect me, you know. What about extending all those generations in the future? You know, that, that's the thing. Like we need to obviously find some way to communicate that. We're struggling with that. Um, but, you know, that, I think that there's a key there somewhere. And yeah, maybe I can add on that is, uh, uh, I, I know I, I put you in touch with, with uh, Linda Booth Sweeney, Kate. I don't know if you already had, a, had an exchange. But how do you get to those people if um, if they have children? Um, wunderbar, fantastic, great stuff. Um, it's 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 definitely through through schools. Somebody just put it in the in the in the in the chat. That is equally challenging, but it's definitely felt as being very very um, effective and and missing. Laura, did you want to come in? Yes, thanks. Uh, in, in Brussels, we are also struggling with this issue, but we, we decided for the project to, to go with people who already want to get started, uh, to, to work with them uh, in order to, to build also the tool, the concrete tool, and at the same time to show the importance of, uh, of doing it more broadly and to use maybe sensitization tools and, and uh, yeah. Through, through the object, maybe using the, the, the object uh, in the middle of the donut and so on. So we, we, we really want first to go, to, to show it can work uh, and then uh, enlarge, enlarge the, the movement and, uh, and trying to involve more people. Great. Um, and I just want to say, actually, in the chat box, there's been lots of people asking questions about schools and young people and engaging with education as well. Um, that's a whole other area that we can't wait to dive into. And I, I just want to acknowledge there's so much energy here today around that. So let's all just imagine that sometime in the new year, uh, we could have, and I'm, I haven't put a month on it, but sometime next year, we could have a webinar just like this, 
with people who are bringing these ideas to alive in education, whether it's primary school or secondary school and how. So please do connect with us on Deals platform, join the platform, signal that you're interested in education. You could even create an event saying, do you want to talk about turning these tools into education with us? And that, that's how things like this will come about. Okay, a great question from Mathilde. Which core skills do you think are required within a team like the ones you've got in, in Brussels and in Cambridge and in Berlin to make this donut project happen at a city level? So what is it that you're bringing together that you think, okay, these are the diversity of skills that we need to be able to make this happen? Nice big open question. More echo than ego, yeah? With the C and the G. Uh, so think of the others are interested in the opinions of the others, share with them. That is of importance. Don't think that your own subject is more important than the subject of the others. Uh, be open-minded. Uh, this is very essential. Brilliant, more eco than ego. Beautiful. One letter changes everything. Clara, do you wanna provide some wisdom on this? What is it that is making this work in Cambridge? Oh, I think uh, lots of really, uh, really bright, passionate people all coming together at the right time, a crazy time. Um, yeah, I think, I think uh, the world has changed so much with COVID. Um, and the way that we're working together is so different from how we could ever imagine we'd be working together a year ago. Um, so yeah, I think synchronicity and opportunity really. And then anybody else? Yeah, Laura. Yeah, I, I agree with the, the fact that we have to be open-minded uh the the skill of creativity also i think we we need a lot of uh creativity in order to to be able to to think uh yeah more broadly um enthusiasm of course uh is important but also technical skills uh, we we tackled the issue of indicators before uh, I think if if we want to make the donut a, a real tool for for change, um, we need to be able to to tackle this this aspect, uh, to understand how indicators are made, uh, to to see how we can create new ones. I think it's important. Um, and uh, I had other ideas, but I don't remember. I I leave the floor. Sebastian. <laughs> Yeah, it's maybe, maybe one that, uh, and uh, no, you said uh, enthusiasm. It's really about um, the notion of freedom. So it's, we, we, we have this urge for, for, for liberation and we sometimes forget responsibility that comes, that comes with it. And in self-organization, um, as we, I, I believe we see this, uh, or at least I, we see it here, um, we usually see organizations like machines and we kind of like, uh, ignore the very complex, unpredictable um, human interactions. And, and that's challenging. And probably the most challenging is how do we actually deal with um, conflict and constructively communicate? So those skills are, are definitely um, important. Katie, go for it. Yeah, I think in Cambridge also people, we've got storytellers who have got involved and artists who have got involved. So it's not just your the normal you know graphics and it's not normal the way of recording and communicating and so we want all of these people who who are passionate to use their individual skills to tell their stories and and be able to tell their stories going forward in the future so we're encouraging everybody maybe i would like to add something which is i think very important about this question of inclusiveness uh, we, we need people able to cross the world uh, and not to to make a donut just for one part of the of the citizens and it's it can 
seem obvious, but it's so difficult to to think also with uh, very very diverse uh, persons and to build tools and to to create something with people thinking differently, having different kind of framework, cultural framework, uh, social frameworks, and so. But this is this is uh, I think very important also. Great. So I can, I'm seeing the time, I'm going to hand back to Andrew in a minute. I'm going to answer quickly one question and ask all of you one last question and then hand back to Andrew. So Liana asks a question. She says, is there a, is there a workshop or a tool on, on Deals platform that people can learn about how to adapt the framework online? Yes, Liana, there is. And for everybody, if you go to Deals platform, donateconomics.org and look under tools and stories, there's a methodology document that Andrew wrote up about creating city portraits, and it describes exactly the process we went through to create that city portrait for Amsterdam. You can also find Amsterdam's city portrait there, so you can compare Amsterdam's portrait and, and the methodology. But just to say again, we just describe how we did it in that context. But everybody you're listening to today has probably had a look at that and said, okay, and now we're going to adapt it for where we are. And so they're creating new methodologies. And then the other part of Liana's question was, is there a framework for, for and coming from Global South countries? I'm so glad you asked that because that is absolutely at the heart of what we want to do and people we want to work with next. As I said before, we began with cities of the Global North because we believe that they have the responsibility to move first and fastest because of their overshoot of planetary boundaries and historic responsibility to act. So we developed this framework focusing on reducing the consumption of the Global North cities. And that's why we're featuring here today, Global North cities. But we believe this framework absolutely can be and is being used by towns and cities and nations from the Global South. And as DEAL, we're passionate about working with others to develop that framework. So how do we take that framework I introduced earlier and make it relevant to the context and interests and needs of Global South cities and towns and countries? So please join us on the platform and we'll be indicating if we're putting on events later around that and collaborating and creating a first version of a tool. So yes, that is important and definitely coming. Okay, a last question for our panel. It's from Caitlin. She says, what advice would you all have for people wanting to set up new community and city groups? And, and it's great to ask it to all of you because you've set up groups, you've, uh, you, you're you're you know there's so many people on this webinar who I think but how how do you start well right in front of us we have people who just started so we'd love to hear uh what advice do you have for people who want to get started and start doing the kinds of things that you're doing in Cambridge I I just ha I just happen to be really interested inspired as I said but I think the I think the grassroots uh, initiative definitely would have taken off without me as a, a local politician but um just but me, a local politician being interested, I think um, adds weight to the project. And, but also I, I had been involved with some other really interesting groups and was able to give a little bit of advice about strategic working together and um, uh, how influence can be gained locally and and but also how the voices of residents and organizations are heard certainly at local authority level and i think going up to you know higher up the bureaucracy really but but uh, but also um i i you know we, we we talked about you know getting the message out about setting up a website and maybe using tools like slack was really interesting but um but also the the, the grassroots forming a, a group together rather than just being a great big group of people, you know, to try and, and make sure your voice was heard by forming a, a focus group or an action group. Let's hear the other side of that story from Clara. Yeah, so I wasn't there right at the start, but I was with mutual aid groups um, and it just started with somebody setting, you know, the mutual aid activities starting in Cambridge was somebody setting up a Facebook group and then within uh, one weekend, 
I think that there were over a thousand people, or like 500 people. And it just, you know, it just kept snowballing and kept snowballing and it was self-organizing and it was just exhilarating to watch and really, really awesome. And I think with any good idea, any thing that just needs to happen, you just need to start, you seed it somewhere. There are other people that think like you, that know that there is a time, this is the time for these ideas to just, you know, start springing up and fruiting. Um, so, you know, you just need to start. We have some amazing tools available now. Facebook is brilliant. I would always start with Facebook actually for the reach with somebody who are also maybe casting around thinking, you know, what's going on? You know, I, 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 I'm coming across these ideas and I want to do something. So it's just starting and just see where it goes, really. It doesn't, you know, you might as long as you just have a few people clustering around, they have friends, they have friends of friends. Um, our group has really grown very organically. Of course, we have created social media platforms, because, uh, social media, uh, uh, you know, we've got websites, we've got a Twitter feed, we've got Facebook, find us on all of them. Um, but uh, really the, 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 the group really came together through those already existing networks, those little groups, you know, the um, Transition Cambridge and all these other places, sustainable foods, you know, that that's, you just have to start really, you know. Great advice. Um, our friends from Berlin, do you want to jump in? How do you just make things start? When we look back, there was nearly in every town a local Agenda 21 group. This slept somehow, but with a donut, it can be recovered. Uh, and this happens in Berlin, for example. Uh, church uh, movements in that social uh, sphere have usually worked on that subject. So get back to church groups and unite with others. Uh, we will do that for the next year in order to support our sustainability strategy that shall be passed in Berlin somehow. Uh, and then you find these social groups in every city, invite them, bring them together, discuss it with them. They usually have to learn what the donut is and then it starts to grow. Fantastic. And I can, we've got three minutes. So if I could ask one of our friends in uh, Brussels to jump in and give us the same answer. How did you get started? Yes, uh, I would for sure advise to to read the book, you book, Kate, <laughs> in order to to really know it, it, it's not a joke. I think it's it's very important not to to understand uh, the philosophy to to open your mind also. So we everyone in our group has read it, and we we still advise people to to read it. But then uh, to to be in contact with as many people as possible uh, at the local government level, uh, at the uh, civil society level to hear what's going on, what are the needs, um, who would like to be in. Uh, I think it's very important in order to, to create the team and then to make it grow uh, and to make it known also. Uh, yeah. Thank you so much for incredibly rich advice. I have no doubt that there are so many people on this webinar who are thinking, right, I'm actually just like them. I'm a, I'm a resident in my local town and I can just start to make it happen. So thank you. I'm going to hand back to Andrew. Wow. Okay. That was fantastic. Thank you all, all to all of the speakers and all of the panelists and all of the people super active in the chat and to everybody who has joined uh us this evening or this morning or wherever you are it's been i've learned a lot i think i'm coming away more inspired than i was before which i didn't think was possible so thank you for that and finally i just wanted to share again this is our first webinar and we're uh, you know this is our first attempt at it so if anybody has a last moments or thoughts or reflections or feedback to throw in the chat that we can learn from that would be fantastic for our next webinars. And as well, as Kate mentioned, you know, we're planning on having holding this series. So 
So if you have suggestions, if you have ideas on on different topics that we can that we can have, you know, a conversation like this or a different format or who knows, uh, please pop them in. We're very happy to learn. So I will keep this open for another minute or so to see where the chat comes in. But in the meanwhile, I'd please like to thank my the the speakers and the panelists again and to Kate for uh, moderating the questions super well, and just everybody. Thanks a lot. Thanks to you. Thank Thanks, you. everybody. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. The ripples Thank of inspiration you. are just rippling out already. Thank you. <laughs> Bye. <laughs>